hello everyone in this uh, presentation i'll be talking about the functional connectivity of the human brain and we'll see its application to subject specific information in healthy control and to improve the classification accuracy in schizophrenia patient so uh, this is our human brain and it has fascinated researchers since a long time and every fact has raised new questions so one such fact is that at least 20% of the total energy produced by the body is consumed by the brain even when it is not performing any cognitive task. So given this fact, one can ask these questions. So can we figure out what is the brain doing when we aren't doing anything? If yes, how? Okay, this is an important question. What is it doing to consume 20% of the energy? Other questions can be, are there activities in the brain unique to one's personality? Are the activities that are going in my brain unique from what uh, are going in your brain? Uh, are these activities different in patients that have mental disorders like schizophrenia? Like so these are some questions that one can ask given this fact. So let's find out. Okay, so first let us focus on this question. Can we figure out what it is doing when we aren't doing anything and if yes, how? So there are different neuroimaging modalities by which we can actually get the brain signal. So one such is the EEG where you uh, place electrodes and get the brain signal. Other is the magnetoencephalogram that is MEG by which using magnetic fields and sensor coils you get the signal. However, in our presentation we will be focusing on resting state fMRI signal. So what is resting state fMRI? Uh, during an fMRI scan, the person who is undergoing an fMRI scan lies inside the MRI machine and he is not doing anything by anything. Uh, he is uh, just awake and that's all. I mean, uh, he is not doing any cognitive task. This is what we call as a resting state fMRI. He is at rest. Okay. And uh, over here, the signal that comes out from this is known as the fMRI signal and it is a four dimensional signal because our brain is 3D and we take this brain signal across time. So we have these brain val volumes across time and like this we get the four dimensional brain signal. Now the four dimensional brain signal can also be represent as, represented as follows. So we can have one three dimensional volume which can be divided into what is called as a voxel. So this is uh, basically, uh, you would be fam familiar with pixels. So this is nothing but a volumetric pixel, a pixel having a volume, hence the name voxel. And we can say each voxel has a time series. So this time component is actually over here. So there is uh, there are voxels within the brain and each voxel has a time series. This is how we represent the fMRI signal. Now, there was a very interesting study where uh, Bharat Biswal, what he did was, he took the, he took a seed voxel, so say this B point is a seed voxel, whose time series looks something like this, okay. And what he did was, he correlated or he used the Pearson correlation to correlate this voxel's time series, the voxel that is at B, with uh, to correlate with all other voxels that are there in this brain okay and these red portions that you see are those voxels which have correlations more than 0 0.35 and the yellow voxel are those that have correlation less than minus 0 0.35 so this is highly uh, correlated red regions and yellow regions are highly negatively correlated okay so very interesting thing that you can see is even though say this B is located over here and let me pick out a voxel over here uh, which is very far from it even though they are far from each other they have the same or similar time series isn't this surprising so this is at some different brain region this is some other brain region still both of them have the have similar uh, time series right so in some sense we can say and we know that they are not physically connected these two voxels are not connected physically 
so what is it how how come both of them have the same um, signal right so it it turns out that this actually is uh, so they are not actually connected by structure but they are connected by function so there is some function that is going in the brain because of which both of these voxels they they belong to that function function or they they are used in that function and because of which both of them are connected and hence there is this name functional connectivity that is given to it okay so this is what we call as a functional connectivity now if you see the yellow voxel it looks something like this these yellow voxels are also important because they are anti correlated they also give some information about the seed voxel it is just that it is uh, 180 degree flipped right so they also have some information however if you look at some other place you'll see that that is totally different from what uh, is there in the seed box right so this is a brief to functional connectivity and uh, further if you see over here we were we got this pattern only because our seed was this and yeah one more important thing that it is seen that this particular pattern is similar across different subjects so today if i go for an fmri scan i a uh, uh, resting state fmri scan you will see such a pattern in my brain as well the si similar pattern so not exactly same but yeah the similar pattern and this is what proved that resting state fmri studies have some uh, signal so there is, these, these are not noise these are no noisy signals but these are actually something that is consistent across uh, different subjects now if you change the seed voxel so say if i take the seed voxel over here so this voxel is now correlated with each other then you'll see that this is the pattern that emerges and it turns out that this is nothing but the default mode network now the default mode network is a very interesting network because uh, it is seen that this default mode network is only active when we are not doing any cognitive task so while we are in rest this is what is active so this can be uh, associated with mind wandering so when you are at rest when you are not doing anything your mind wanders uh, maybe it will be what food would i eat today or it will be something like oh, uh, what what should i do Uh, in my open seminar so something that is uh, where your brain is wandering this can also be related to some movies like uh, which marvel movie should i watch next and so on so that is something that the default mode network is associated with if you further change the seed now if my seed is over here i can get the visual network so this uh, basically uh, talks about the visual processing in your brain then there's the frontoparietal network and in the frontoparietal network this particular network is associated to goal uh, orientation so what goal are you oriented to so it is it turned out that this is associated with that and then the motor cortex where you uh, basically uh, the motor signal so like if i move my hand like this this is the motor signal so this is the motor network uh, that people found out so like this you can have different signals or different networks if you place your seed accordingly now this actually if you see is dependent on the seed and this is a connection where one seed is connected to all other voxels right but uh, what if uh, i want all connections that is all seeds connected to all others so can i just uh, do a simple correlation of every voxel with every other voxel well the answer is no why because the dimension becomes huge so there are roughly 1 lakh voxels in the brain and if you uh, correlate every voxel with every other voxel you'll get a matrix a correlation matrix that is a 1 lakh cross 1 lakh which is huge dimension and it becomes very difficult to process it so what what can we do uh, is there any solution well yes the solution is brain atlas if you actually see over here you'll see that adjacent regions or the regions that are close or the voxels that are close to each other are highly correlated very highly correlated right so because of this you can see that we can actually put them into one region 
and instead of uh, assuming every voxel to be an independent quantity we can actually bifurcate all these uh, voxels into something known as a region how using a brain atlas so what a brain atlas you uh, does is people use clustering methods and all different types of methods to come up with a brain atlas and they divide the whole brain into different regions so they every color over here represent a different region over here so this is how a brain atlas is formed now what to do with a brain atlas well simple once you have a brain atlas what you do is take all the voxels so uh, consider this green region take all the voxels in the green region and uh, take the average of that okay so that will be one time series for a region so like this you get one time series for the entire region and if there are n regions in a brain atlas you will get an n cross n correlation matrix so this is how you can get a full functional connectivity matrix and uh, if you also uh, see uh, over here you will see some areas where the correlation is high so these boxes over here it turns out that these are actually the resting state functional connectivity network that we just saw so say for this so this is the visual network so all the nodes that are over here so all these nodes or all these regions that are over here belong to the visual cortex or over here the visual region that i just saw you i just uh, uh, showed you right so this is the visual cortex similarly this is the default mode network so here you can actually distinctly see the different networks that are present in the uh, uh, brain right so these are the different networks that we will uh, see uh, this is given by yo et al okay. so moving forward now this matrix is actually a symmetric matrix so what we do is we take the upper triangular uh, upper triangular part of this because it is symmetric and we uh, make a vector out of it so basically grabbing all these values and making a vector out of it okay so this is the upper triangular of the functional connectivity matrix and this is how we can represent a person so uh, the person say i went through the fmri scan i got this fc so i will be now represented with this particular vector over here okay now let us focus on some important points over here one is let us focus on the brain atlas so uh, there are various different types of brain atlases proposed in the literature one is the whole brain atlas which covers all the regions in the brain okay uh, so so you you may wonder why is this not covered so this is actually the white matter region and and fmri signals basically focus on the gray matter region okay so there is another study known as dti which focuses on white matter okay we focus only on the gray matter signal now uh, there is something known as a cortical brain atlas the cortical brain atlas if you can see just covers the surface of the brain it does not go in the interior so here you can see this is the brain and only the surface areas are covered it does not go into the interior okay then there are spherical rois so with spherical ROIs, what people do is people take a seed voxel. So using some uh, techniques, they understand that these are some important voxels uh, in the brain. And then what they do is they take a five millimeter sphere around that seed voxel, and all the voxels that come in that sphere is considered into the brain region. So like this, we get the spherical ROIs brain atlas. Okay, so this if you see does not cover all all the all the voxels like uh, like over here but uh, it covers only a certain area of that okay so actually how how do you understand uh, okay so now the question is which one to use right which which type of brain atlas one can use so in our study we have compared these different atlases and uh, we have shown that which atlas is better for a particular application so that is something that uh, I'll talk about in more detail. Next, so this was about the brain atlas. Now let us focus over here. Okay, what is it that you have to focus over here? Well, let's find out. So the FC, when you, the original correlation values look like this. Now in the literature, people have also focused on 
something known as a fisher z normalization and something known as a degree normalization let me just briefly cover them what they are and then i'll come back so fisher z transform so what does fisher z transform does is basically if you see the upper triangular vector and take its histogram okay it looks something like this the histogram of this particular uh, upper triangular vector if you see this is skewed this is skewed towards the uh, right right so the, actually uh, traditionally there were certain applications where we actually needed a normal uh, what we say a normal a gaussian distribution or a normal distribution and because of the normal distribution because we wanted a normal distribution for the correlation fisher came uh, with this formula uh, this formula or this transform where if you basically change the correlation values like this so if there is a correlation value of minus 0.6 that will get mapped to somewhere over here which is a minus 1.1 right so if you change this or transform all the values in this fashion then you will actually get a normal distribution and this is what the fisher z transform does what you have to do is you have to basically on every correlation value put this formula you get the z and that is a fisher z transform so that is the matrix over here the fisher z transform matrix okay then there is something known as a degree normalization with degree normalization what people did is this is our fc matrix you can first take the absolute so all the minus become positive then what you do is you sum across rows so for every node you will understand how much is the connectivity of that node with other nodes okay so with that you get something that is known as a degree of the node okay so for this particular node what is the degree it is the sum of all these values and then just put the degree into a diagonal matrix and uh, transform uh, this functional connectivity or the mod of a as like this so what happens basically is every a value over here is divided by its degree that is more or less the uh, motivation and this is the degree transformed value that you get okay now these are the different normalizations that people have used but they have never compared between which is better so people have just used them uh, arbitrarily right so in our work we are also going to compare across the three normalizations or this is actually no normalization and we'll see which is better okay. right so these were certain answers to the first question can we figure out what it is doing well there is something that is going on in the brain because the functional connectivity networks talks uh, tells you about that how do you do that we can do that with resting state fmr however we can also do it with eeg and meg the other question that we can ask is are these activities of the brain unique to one's personality are these unique are is my person is my activity unique to your activity and so on right or different from your activity or so on right so that is something that we will see now so the, the motivation is as follows so say consider face images over here now uh, it is well shown that a face image can be decomposed into a common component and a subject specific component where the common component is common across all the faces if you see uh, these eyes are quite similar across uh, faces the eyebrows these are all present in almost every faces and uh, so these are in the common uh, common component uh, whereas if you see the nose if you see the structure of the nose it is so different so if you see the nose over here and if you see her nose it is so very different right so this is something that comes into the subject specific component so this is how you actually recognize as a a, a particular person if you recognize she is a different person as compared to uh, her right so that comes into the subject specific and you can recognize both of them as humans because of the common component because it's a common component of the humans right now the question is can we do this with the functional connectivity matrix we just saw right so this is the motivation that we can we do this with the fc okay so see uh, let us see a few goals so the goals for this particular work is to extract the subject specific component from the functional connectivity look at the effect of changing the brain atlases look at the effect of the different normalization method and come up with a metric that quantifies the subject specific component i'll talk about the metrics a little later but we'll see that as well 
okay so for uh, proving the hypothesis we have used two different data sets one is the midnight scan club data set and the other is the hnu data set now in the midnight scan club data set there are 10 different subjects or 10 different individuals and we have 10 scans per subject so one subject from here has given us 10 different fmri scans so the same subjects the same subject is scanned 10 times like this okay and for hnu it is 30 subjects and same 10 scans per subject so total we have these many subjects and scans so what we do is with this we uh, come up with a data matrix which looks something like this so this is the upper triangular vector and these are the different sessions or scans okay so for a particular subject so let's say the first subject over here uh, this is the matrix for that because there is uh, these are the upper triangular FCs and these are across the different scans. Okay, so this is the first subject, second subject, third subject. Like this, we come, we have all the four subjects, uh, forty subjects over here, and this is how we represent our input. So this is how uh, this is the vector, or this is the, these are the matrices on which we are going to work on. Okay. Next. So how do we extract the subject specific and common component? So for that there is a dictionary learning algorithm known as Kobe and we are going to use this algorithm. So the Kobe algorithm splits our input data matrix into a common component and a subject specific component. Okay, let us just uh, look at this a, a little uh, with um, examples. So this is our data matrix that we just discussed. Now this data matrix using the Kobe algorithm will give us these common components and subject specific components. So the common components actually have a dictionary that is learned that is D and it has C atoms in it and these are the coefficients of the dictionary. Now these atoms if you see is common across all the subjects. All the subjects can be created by a linear combination of these atoms. Okay, hence this is the common component. However, these are subject specific. So these components are unique to the particular subject. Okay, so it's just uh, comparing them with the face images. These are the face images in our, uh, our um, analogy. This is the common component that we'll get for the face and this is a subject specific component. Okay, now uh, first let me just briefly tell you how Kobe works. So So this is our problem, we need Y to be separated into a common and a subject specific component. So first we find out D, this common subspace matrix using the Kobeck algorithm. So this is the Kobeck algorithm, I will not go into the detail because this is not something that I have proposed. And uh, you once D is found out, we then find out XN like this, so just take the transpo transpose and then do some linear algebra stuff and use least squares to find out xn so when you use the least squares uh, it is an assumption that the d uh, d transpose and d the uh, so d is a orthogonal matrix so every atom in d is orthogonal hence this becomes identity so that goes and then these two are also uh, assumed to be orthogonal and hence this also goes away and hence we are just left with xn so this is how we can get xn uh, and then uh, what we do is we uh, just subtract yn from dxn that we have got over here and we get the subject specific component. We'll just look at that uh, in a second. Right. So how do you actually use Kobe? So it is as follows. So there are two pipelines and this is what is proposed. So there is a training phase where in the training space you have the data matrix you get the d using the Kobeck algorithm you get this using least squares then what you do is you multiply these two you get dxi now that you subtract from the original and that is how you get the subject specific component okay then for the test what you do so this is the training phase okay now in the test when a new scan will be given to you what you'll do is so in the new scan you will not have a matrix like this because now you don't know whether uh, which scan belongs to which subject right so here actually you will have the different fc vectors so one scan only right so that is something that you will have 
and uh, what you do is you find the coefficients using least squares coefficients are what you take this matrix that is our d matrix put that over here and find its coefficient okay so these are the coefficients with respect to this on these so these are the basis of it again same thing you get you get x you multiply dx um, uh, subtracted by the original y and you get your subject specific component now the question over here is how do you know this is right well in the case of face you can actually visually see that it is showing you the nose and so on but over here we cannot actually visually see whether this is correct or not we need some metric or we need something to identify whether this is right or not right so for that there are the different metrics that are uh, some are existing and uh, there is one metric that i have proposed so first let us look at idif which is actually individual differentiate differentiability so uh, what how does idif work is as follows what you do is you have the ith session of all the subjects over here in this matrix okay the ith session of all the subjects then you have the jth session of all the subjects in this matrix okay what you do is just do a correlation between them and you get this let us just understand this matrix a little more uh, better so let's say here you have one uh, subject so this is subject one's ith scan okay now this particular first uh, column is again subjects one j scan so these are the two different scans right so this is the same subject this two the same subject but different scan and when you see the correlation value it will come over here on the diagonal and this is the same subject scan right so this should actually be more similar because it is the same subject scan so the same subject scan should be similar so this should have a high correlation value on the other hand if you compare subject one with subject two j scan that will come over here in here and this should not have a high correlation value because these are two different subjects right and so on you go for subject 3 you go for all the subjects over here so you will complete the first row and then you go for the second subject so over here this second subject you will compare with all the different subjects that are over here right so like this you get this matrix and over here you can understand that uh, the mean of the diagonal or the diagonal elements actually uh, talk about the same subject and the non-diagonal elements talk about different subjects and the mean of the diagonal elements is what we ca we call as i self the individual uh, self something like that i self and non-diagonal is i others okay and uh, what we do is actually we want maximum separation between the two we want this to be higher or in some sense this should be close to one these uh, correlation values and these correlation values should be close to zero so ideally i self should be one the mean should be one and this should be zero so one minus zero is one into 100 you get the uh, percentile a uh, percentage kind of thing so you uh, so this is how i diff is this defined for two sessions i and j i and j but we have 10 sessions so if s is the number of sessions uh, we'll have s cap number of pairs which where s cap is nothing but s into s minus 1 by 2 and uh, you just take the mean of all the different idif values that you get across the session and that is how you get the final idif right so higher the idif the close idif is uh, the close it is 200 the better uh, the subject specific component is there because they uh, say that uh, the scans are similar uh, uh, with sim same subjects and different across different subjects right so that is one the other is what we are proposing that is the overlap with overlap what we do is so we have this subject specific data matrix we have all subjects into sessions over here all the sessions are over here and what we do is we actually concatenate it such that uh, the sessions of the same subject are together so like uh, say say i have 10 sessions so all the 10 sessions of the first subject are over here 10 sessions of the next subject will be over here and so on then do a correlation so you will get this matrix so over here you can see that you get a block kind of a thing over here so why you're getting this block because 
these actually belong to the same subject these are correlations of the same subject so this should be high right and these non diagonal elements belong to different subjects so they should be low right now what we do is we actually plot a histogram so all the values that are in these diagonal blocks come into b uh, wss that is nothing but within subject similarity so these are within subject similarity score and those are this blue uh, histogram and uh, the 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 non diagonals are the uh, between subject similarities over here uh, so this is the histogram that you plot now given this what we want is we want to find out the correlation value or the threshold if if a particular correlation value is above the threshold i'll say it belongs to the same subject if it is below the threshold i'll say it belongs to a different subject so how do you find the threshold simple so this is the threshold that will give you maximum uh, or the minimum error right so this is a threshold that we find out so basically just find out where the histograms are intersecting and then if you just zoom into this part there will be some values that are in error and this is our metric so calculate the total number of points that are in error and this is overlap so we want ideally to have zero error so overlap it is better if it is zero and the higher the overlap the uh, less good your subject specific component is now how do you test the new uh, subject so this is again training phase now during the test what you'll do this is the subject specific matrix you have so these are all the test subjects uh, go through the correlation so this is the correlation that you get now uh, again use the histogram technique so all these come over here and all the others come over here and then use the same threshold right so the the threshold will now come from here now this will not be an intersection of the two histograms but it will be the threshold that comes from up right and whatever is that in error is the overlap value during test okay so this is the metric that we are proposing this is uh, this actually takes this 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 metric takes care of uh, the threshold that one can use the optimal threshold that one can use to identify a particular subject now further if you see idif it says that the means of the within subject and between subject correlation should be far apart for better repeatability right so if the means are far apart from each other uh, if these means are far apart that means your actual distribution is going away which is something that we want right so that talks about the distributions or the means however overlap talks about that there should be a threshold that can differentiate between the within and between subjects with minimum error right so both of these are important this gives you better repeatability or generalization and overlap gives you one objective threshold that will work for all the subjects so in order to uh, in some sense combine both of them what we use is we use the ratio of idif to overlap we wanted a minimum overlap so ideally zero and we wanted a higher idif ideally 100 so the ratio should be maximized right and this is how the uh, ratio varies when overlap and idif are varies so whatever results that we'll show you will be based on this ratio now okay right so these are the results okay so let me just uh, quickly go through the results so here there are the different normalizations methods that i just uh, talked about this is the training phase and this is the test phase okay important observations that one can make over here is one if you see fisher z normalization is working better then the no normalization and degree normalization so over here you can see just a normalization technique can give you improved results right a very important point to note over here other if you see over here the different colors actually talk about the different resting state networks that we just discussed okay i did not discuss all of them i just discussed which were important uh, for my work so if you see the red one that is the default mode network which is associated with mind wandering it is giving you a very nice or it is giving a higher subject specific component the other is frontoparietal which is associated with goal uh, orientation uh, your goal goal orientation 
so these two actually make sense they are they are different with respect to different individuals because of which they are anti top on the other hand if you see a uh, visual uh, network over here the visual network is low because inside the mri scanner everybody would be looking at the same thing the mri scanner from inside right so there is not something subject specific in this particular network everything is same right same same goes for the motor as well this is a motor network right so so these are some more contribution uh, some more uh, observations and then if you see the kobe algorithm this is the kobe algorithm we we propose it is giving you the best uh, subject specific component you can see that these are the other uh, algorithms uh, in uh, used in the literature and uh, we are comparing it with, with it with kobe and you can see uh, the results are quite similar i mean the trend is quite similar as you change the normalization schemes or if you change uh, if you see training and testing however this drops down the training has a score of 1.5 and this has 0.8 but still it is doing better at least from the original this is by not using any uh, dictionary learning algorithm just using the original correl correlation values or in the sense fisher's error and in the sense degree normalization and these are the different degree uh, di dictionary learning algorithm now the other is variation with atlas so uh, one important thing that i would i wanted you i want to tell you over here is that if you see the arrangement of this uh, atlas is important over here how is I, how have i arranged the atlas is are in decreasing order of average voxels per region so decreasing order of average voxels per region what do i mean by that is if you see shaffer 100 it has a lot of voxels per region so if you consider one region it will have these many voxels and i've just taken the average so it has the maximum average voxels per region so what happens is when you compute the fc there's a lot of average that you'll have to do so these many av voxels you'll have to average out because of which you can get an averaging effect on the other hand if you see power it has very low voxels per region okay so over here the averaging effect would be uh, less so this is how we have arranged the uh, atlases and you can see that as the dec as the average number of voxels decreases the uh, I the ratio actually improves right you can see an upward trend now if you see this point over here you can see this is having actually 400 nodes and because of that you can see it has a good a very good uh, id uh, value uh, uh, sorry a uh, ratio value right but if you see dosen back it just has 164 regions still it is comparable to the 300 roi atlas as well right so this so the important conclusion one can make is that more number of regions are also required and less average voxels per regions are required okay and so these are some important observations on uh, the which brain atlas you should used used okay so that is the second result now talking about uh, the the last question are the activities different with patients having mental disorder like schizophrenia okay so well let's find out so what are the goals for this work? First, you'll have to classify between schizophrenia and healthy control. Is there any classifier that we can train to distinguish between schizophrenia and healthy control? Look at the effect of brain atlases. Look at the effect of normalization method. And this is the data set that we have using. Uh, there's a UCLA and a COBRA data set that gives me these many subjects, uh, healthy and schizophrenia subjects. And in total, we have these many subjects. So what is the overview? So here we have the functional connectivity FC upper triangular vector on the column. And like this, we have concatenated all the healthy subjects into one matrix and all the schizophrenic subjects into a different matrix. Okay. So the first thing is to reduce the dimension. Now this N cap is actually huge because if you even consider 400 subjects, so the upper triangular would be 400 into 400 minus 1 that is 399 by 2 so roughly 200 into 399 or roughly 200 into 400 which is still a huge number it is around 40,000 right so huge number and we have subjects in hundreds or 200 
right so this is actually a problem there's a big dimension that you have over here so first thing is to extract features so ex uh, we have to first understand which are important dimensions or which are the important fc elements over here and only use them we don't want to use the entire fc upper triangular matrix so for that we have two different feature extractors one is t test so by t test what we do is uh, this is our matrix we see every fc element one by one so this is the first element that we are looking at okay first element for both uh, if you see the box plot across subjects you get a distribution and you see how much these two means or these are medians but if you i mean they're similar to mean so how much these two means are separated from each other okay so that is what t-test looks at and uh, using this you come up with a p-value i'll not go into the details of t-test but the gist is that you get a p-value if the means are well separated your p-value would be zero if the means are not well separated if they are same then your p-value will be one okay using a p-value we only select those elements that have a uh, good uh, what we say a uh, distinction in schizophrenia and healthy subjects so with this what will happen is our sub uh, fc matrix will become small so this was n cap this will now become mt test and this will become mt test for schizophrenia okay uh, the other um, other that we can use is kendall tau with kendall tau what we do is just say consider we are considering the ith element of fc okay and we are considering the jth healthy subject so we get x of ij so this is a correlation value of the ith fc element and jth healthy subject and kth schizophrenia subject okay this is a number okay this is not a matrix and what we do next is we compare so this is healthy ij healthy this is schizophrenic if you just subtract both of them if the sign is positive that is if x i j is greater than x i k then what you do is there is a n c i'll talk about n c in some time you just increment that initially n c is zero okay and if it is the opposite if schizophrenia is greater then you increment n d okay now this you have done for the first schizophrenia subject so i am comparing this healthy subject with this subject schizophrenic now i change the schizophrenic subject again i do the same thing i increment nc and nd accordingly third in the third subject and so on you'll do it for all the subjects once this is over what what happens is you have compared this healthy subject with all the schizophrenic subjects then what you do is you go to the second healthy subject compare again all the schizophrenic subjects okay so like this you'll get m cross n if there are m healthy subjects and n uh, schizophrenic subjects you'll get an m cross n uh, m cross n different pairs okay so the final tau that we calculate for ith fc element is as follows so let me just explain this in a gist so you in all you have m cross n different uh, pairs nc talks about for that particular pair for that ith the healthy controls are greater how many healthy controls are greater than the schizophrenic uh, patients or the correlation of healthy controls how much it is greater than the schizophrenic patient now if both of them are same so if say uh, yeah both of them are same then that means that this particular uh, element this fc element is not giving any useful information because for half of them the healthy controls are greater than schizophrenia for other half schizophrenic are greater than healthy control right so there is no general discrimination between the two for this particular fc right so hence tau would be zero for that so this is not an important fc or this is not an important element for us on the other hand if d is greater that is for this particular element mostly schizophrenia has more correlation value as compared to healthy then what will happen is your tau would be negative which will tell that okay more schizophrenic uh, people are uh, having uh, having high correlations as compared to the healthy controls and the same can be true for vice versa so if healthy controls are higher than uh, schizophrenia 
so accordingly you will get a value of tau now if you get a higher value of tau that means that element is very important and like this what we do is we put a threshold on tau and we get a same uh, matrix for tau as well so this is what we call as significant connectivity right we only choose those fc which are having good tau values okay and then you do pca uh, for further dimension reduction uh, because this also is actually uh, huge and so we use pca for further dimension reduction and then we train an svm classifier now these are the results for the classifier if you see the first thing t test and kendall tau perform similar so both of them so uh, so this is a comparison across the different uh, feature extract extractors that we have used so both of them are quite similar right other observation degree normalization if you see this particular row works better as compared to others okay so just by normalization you can improve your accuracy just by normalization this is a very important point and if you remember for the uh, subject specific components it was special z normalization for this it is uh, degree normalization right so this is an important uh, thing to note and uh, if you see these are whole brain atlases so just uh, if you see whole brain atlases we have cortical and spherical ROIs so these are whole brain atlases and if you see over here uh, this also contain the spherical ROIs as well so these have a better accuracy as compared to the cortical so over here there is a 500 node atlas these are the number of nodes that they have 500 node atlas it still has an accuracy close to 80 percent however with this 300 roi only 300 roi you can get uh, accuracy close to 83 or 85 percent over here right so this is good while there are some exceptions but more or less if you see the trend so here we have just plotted the trend lines the log trend line and a linear trend line uh, so this is what the trend is and um, yeah so that was one thing the other was uh, that yes so that's that's all yeah yeah so these are the important observations that we made that degree normalization works better and whole brain degree normalization atlases work better so in conclusion for the subject specific characteristics default mode and frontoparietal network have better features than other resting state networks is what we have find, found out higher resolution atlas with low average number of voxels are desirable Fisher Z normalization gives us better better results over here for a classification accuracy in schizophrenia whole brain atlases with higher resolution are desirable degree normalization gives better results so for all the machine learning community that is listening to me this is a very important observation that please compare the different normalization methods that are there in your field before uh, coming up to conclusions right so there can be a different normalization technique using that normalization technique you can have a better accuracy or whatever you want these are the different contributions of my work and uh, these are the publications and i would like to thank uh, bharat biswal atul sir uh, and atul sir minas for uh, working with me so they are anil sir's collaborator and last and last but not the least anil sir uh, because without them uh, my work and this presentation wouldn't have been possible so that's all uh, I'm open to questions now. Thank you so much, everyone.